Hi everyone, it is March 31, 2018. Many of you probably know about David Hogg and his lies. And I will tell you, I don't, I can't get into uh, in depth all of what takes place with these latest and greatest events that take place. Why? Because I, I literally can't. Uh, it's not an option for me anymore because I am so thoroughly disgusted, repulsed by the lies that, well, lying is the basis of evil. Anybody who lies is absolutely committing an evil act. Now, you can think for yourself, oh, evil, oh my God, what are you talking about? I mean, it's just a small infraction. Uh, yeah, it's wrong. But evil, Carol, come on. It is. It is. We've all engaged in it. So many of us have lived. Just a, an utter lie. So many Americans accept lies. Hell, we've been voting for the lesser of two evils. We have been using that word in that context, but so many people, and I'm thinking about my social network, oh yes, those educated elite that they think they are, uh, they put themselves in that category. They have no understanding of what elite actually means. But those liberals who, so many, even those who are Christian, well, they can't tolerate language like that because it's religious. So, for so long, man, I was really afraid to speak certain words. Wow. When you think of the social pressure that is on everybody to be just like them, and if you're not, well then you're shamed, you'll have to, you're gossiped about, you're, you're taken down. I think about all of those times that I was with my friends and I watched my language and I didn't, I did not talk about certain experiences that I had because I knew what the reaction would be. So while I wasn't somebody who 100% played it safe, I look back on that and I think, oh God, the influence that others have in our life. The power that that social contract you got to be like everybody else. You got to go along to get along. Because if you don't, if you reveal that, wow, you're an individual, you can get abandoned. And that is absolutely true. There, for so long in my life, I didn't use language that was the language of religion. I wouldn't say Satan. I wouldn't say evil. I wouldn't say satanic because I was indoctrinated so thoroughly that that kind of stuff just didn't take place. It didn't, it didn't exist. Now, who I am, I don't label myself anything. I'm not a Christian, but I do think that Jesus, wow, myth or not, I don't care. What a fabulous, what a fabulous ex example for all people to follow. 
And I have used Jesus as an example. At times when I was asked, you know, by somebody for help, and that self-centeredness kicked in, and I didn't want to, and I, you know. And I don't know where it came from, but suddenly I would hear myself thinking, what would Jesus do? The answer came immediately, and it put me on a right track. Did I do that always? No. Was I self-centered? Yeah. But, would I ever reveal that to my friends? No. Because even the Christian friends would mock it, would mock my saying that Jesus was an example that we all should follow. I would be laughed at. No joke. But they called themselves a Christian. Why? Why would a Christian mock that, laugh at it? Because they didn't want to use Jesus as an example. They just wanted to call themselves a Christian. It gave them a certain, I don't know, pleasure. It gave them this idea in their head no matter how clear it was a delusion, they loved maintaining it. I'm good because I'm a Christian. But I also get to live a life that is so antithetical to any of Jesus' teachings. And if you, if you did try to talk deeply on any subject, that was enough to get you marked as, oh God, Carol, you are so serious. Why don't you lighten up? I had somebody tell me to stop thinking. Stop thinking. So, yeah. We all have these external forces that keep us in line, except those external forces are keeping us in a line that puts us on the wide road, not the narrow road. You know what it says in the Bible? How is it that so many Christians believe they're going to heaven? They all think they're going to heaven. But it's a narrow road. So how is it that Christians... Oh, so look, guys, you've been the majority, okay? And then when I get comments like, you are always picking on Christians. I am... You guys have flooded this country, okay? And you have been this force that has maintained this is a Christian nation and... Well, if that were true, really true, like it was Christians who were not living the pretense and actually taking seriously their Christianity by even just following some of what it says in the Bible, like lying is an abomination. I've had many, many Christians in my life, not one has ever, ever quoted that passage. Or when Jesus says, I will forgive you of your sins, go and sin no more. No one has ever talked to me about that passage. So, he, let's say that Christians didn't lie. We would never have manifested this nightmare. And, if Christians took seriously Jesus saying, go, but sin no, more, sin no more. Well, it's uncomplicated what Jesus is saying there. I will forgive you of your sins. Go and sin no more. Means clean up your act. 
How is it that Christians never talk about that? Or talk about, in the Bible, very clear, lying is an abomination. Oh, they'll talk about homosexuality as an abomination. They'll talk about what other people are doing. They never talk about what they're doing. Oh, yep, you pray, okay. And you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and you were saved. That's it. No more work to be done. So, how did we become a nation? Well, how did we become? We started on a lie. In Christ's name, I can rape and murder and steal children and force them into these schools and abuse them. And should they speak their native language, I can smash them across the face in Christ's name. Well, we started on evil. We never resolved any of that evil. So it's just gotten greater and greater and a, a bigger and mightier force. And now look at what we're living. We are the people of the lie. We started on a lie. We continued on a lie. We grew up to be people who well, as parents, don't lie, children. And all those children, <laughs> they all, they're surrounded by adults who lie. They grow up, and they then become parents. And don't you lie. That's what, you know, that's what they say to their children while they live a lie. I, it's fascinating. It's so clear. And it's fascinating that, you know, it, 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 everything's a lie. We have accepted lies. We have been so socially engineered to accept them, to never call out anybody when they lie, never hold anybody accountable. In the early 80s, I saw something happening. I couldn't really fully articulate what was happening, but I knew something was terribly wrong. The New Age movement sprung in and exploded in action. You create your own reality. As if there's no connection. Like there's no collective reality. And even then I was thinking, okay, the creation of our own reality, doesn't that kind of put us on a self-centered path where we're not really caring about what's happening around us even within our own community? You just get to create your own reality. You get to deny all things negative. And I remember thinking, wait, what is this positive stuff? You know, reality is just, it is, okay? It's not negative, positive. It's just there. And negative things happen and positive things happen. And you're going to just split off. And you think it's good? that you have become a disintegrated soul by splitting off everything that you deem negative. And what is negative, you deem it positive? Oh, because it's just an experience. It's just an experience. We're all just experiencing. It's not negative. All things are positive. Everything Everything that happens, it happens for a reason. And you've got to embrace it. Embrace, embrace like a gift, cancer. Embrace you being traumatized as a gift. It's wonderful. And everything that manifests in your life has everything to do with you 
it doesn't matter at all. The connections or the external forces happening in your life. No, everything that happens is because you have created it for a reason. So embrace it and think about what, what that lesson that God brought to you, your higher power, he brought you these lessons. Now, every experience that we have is a teaching a moment. We've got to learn from our experiences. But there was such an abject denial of all, all things relevant where individuals that came upon circumstances in their life brought to them externally no it has nothing to do with that you manifested this I, it was so I remember in the 80s I, I was thinking what the hell is going on here and then by God you talk about, you know, an experience that you had, no matter how traumatizing or even not traumatizing, but it was a, you know, a bad experience or a, uh, a hurtful experience, whatever it was. You were a victim. You, you have a victim mentality. The word victim demonized. We have victims. It's real. And if somebody, you know, and I'm not disputing the fact that people do take on that victim status and live it and never do anything to change their, you know, circumstances, whatever. Unfortunately, Parents who never ever face what they do to their children and they live their lives blaming their children for everything that happens and then blaming their adult children for everything that happens. They can't ever admit that they have done something wrong. They've got to maintain that self-image. Oh, well, you hear a lot of mothers say, I did the best I could. My mother used to say that. I don't have her in my life, but how many times did this woman say, I did the best I could? For you. You did the best for you, not for your children. And when you talk about these subjects, you do get shamed. And you do, you know, hear, oh, stop the blame. Blame. The word blame got demonized. Jesus. Well, <laughs> Jesus. But blame is something that occurred. And suddenly in the 80s, it was like you were a bad person if you tried to hold somebody accountable. Now, people in AA, and I was, I came into AA at 21. And at that time, people were really working on themselves. But as the New Age philosophy movement got more and more entrenched, I saw people beginning to interpret the steps that require an awful lot of work in AA, the 12 steps. They began to interpret it to suit their own self. And that was okay, because at the same time, moral relativism was getting more and more entrenched. And right from wrong started taking on this individual character. Like it wasn't objective, it was subjective. And someone could wrong another person. Someone could behave wrongly, 
But in their mind, it was right. And that was okay. Because, well, it, they just deemed it okay. It was right. Standards began to just melt away. Standards of communication. It was really by the 2000s, the early 2000s, suddenly I began to recognize that people were using their own definitions of words. And it was completely okay. So I would have a conversation with a former professor, a friend of mine, about atheism, and she maintained she was a Christian, and we would be talking about atheism, and I kept saying, Marco, you're using your own definition, your own definition of what an atheist is. And she would not use the standard definition. And it happened like three times in that conversation. And I said, Marco, I don't know how to talk like this. If you use your own definitions, how do we really communicate? And there was another friend of mine there, a mutual friend of both, but she was far more a friend of, you know, this former professor. And she wasn't engaged in the conversation. She didn't really have deep conversations. She was a mystery reader and that was it, you know, but she was a Christian. Oh, wow, a lying Christian. Who I think was borderline. My housemate, who on her own developed dramas. And I got to be the main character in both. And when you look at your own behavior and how you got caught up with these people, how you stay with these crazy people, when you look back, you see all of those red flags that they just shot up for you, put them right in your face and you ignore them. Very dangerous behavior because the malignant narcissist, the borderline, the psychopath, they can really leave your life in ruins. They have a unique ability to create these fictions. And if you're their target, you don't realize what's happening and what has happened for a long time. That they come in and when they're facing you, oh, they love you and you're wonderful and that, and that but they go out and you're everything but those things to the people the social network that you're in, and they're talking about you. Yeah, that is Christianity to, unfortunately, a lot of people. But it was she, during that conversation with Margo, when I finally said, Margo, I can't, I don't know how to talk like this when you're using your own definitions. She yelled at me and said, what, do you want to use your definition? And I said, no, I want to use the, the, it, there's a the definition. The, not mine, not Margot's, but the. That's why we have a dictionary, right? I couldn't believe what I was living. I had dinner with about five people and they ranged from 25 years of age up to I think 57. And I asked this question. I said, do you guys use your own definitions of words? Every one of them said, yeah. 
I am not kidding you. Every one of them said yes, like I was crazy. So why did I name my original channel Kafka Winston World? Because what I was experiencing in Great Barrington was something I had never experienced before. And because I was in really bad shape trying to get off those medications and my brain, oh my God, I was experiencing so many symptoms. And the stroke that I had, it had not been diagnosed yet. And I kept thinking, am I going crazy? Processing new information was really difficult. I walked around for 10 years feeling like I was in bubble wrap, like there was a film between me and the world. It was so disconcerting, but so much was going on. And, and I kept thinking to myself, is this kind of behavior, did, did people do this always? And I just, I didn't see it because I was so focused on accomplishing my goals and then practicing law. And did I not see this? Or is this a new happening? Or is this because I'm just like, my brain is just not capable of getting things. I, I literally thought that I must be going crazy because I've never, that, that, how do you, how, how do educated people think it's fine to just redefine words if it, works for them. But this is what was happening. All of it a lie. All of it a lie. It was stunning. Everything was a lie. So yes, I did feel like Winston in 1984. And I reread 1984 then. And I felt like Kafka because the fingers were pointed at me. I felt like Mr. K in the trial. And bizarrely, everything my family was doing to me, friends started doing. It was rather challenging and very stressful. Trying at, 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 I was, I don't know how old, 53, 54. My friends were older. Everywhere I went, every social outing I had with friends. Gossip, gossip, gossip. They tearing apart friends, they, people they considered to be friends. And I, I would get like, could we not gossip? Yes, then I was shamed. Their behavior, it was like they were in seventh grade. Oh, Carol, she's just so great. She doesn't gossip. Or the roll of the eyes. And, and I thought, how could we still be doing this? You know, five, six, seven decades later? And we're still behaving like we're in seventh grade. Does anybody like grow? These were people in AA. These were people who really their egos were so attached to the years that they had, but they had 25 years, 25 years of sobriety. Uh, one that it was that former professor who would show up at her home group, where if you have a home group in AA, you show up for, you know, the meetings and you do service for that group. And well, she never did. She hardly went to meetings, but she always showed up for her anniversary. Yay! So good. And she was considered a spiritual pillar. 
And I had a relationship with this woman. And when I do have relationships with people, well, it goes beyond the superficial. So I actually get to know people. And very often, that getting to know is, it involves getting to know their issues. And, and yes, I am somebody who is rather aware and observant. And I can tell when somebody's lying. But when you're in that kind of relationship with somebody, that the basis of it is Alcoholics Anonymous, and working on yourself, and getting yourself to be a better you know, human being, and all that kind of stuff. Well, most people, oh, talk a good game, but they don't walk the good game. So when you try to involve them in conversations about behaviors that are taking place, whoa, uh-uh, no. See, I got sober at a time when people actually did hold people accountable. Suddenly that was gone. You don't. You just have to accept the lie that they live, the lies that they tell. And this woman was so not a spiritual pillar, but the pretense that she lived in this community allowed that, oh, uh, deeming of spiritual pillar to manifest. It was all a lie. I would meet people before they spoke at AA meetings. We'd go out for coffee or dinner or something, and people would be really struggling. And they would be talking about, you know, crying about certain things. And then they'd walk into the meeting and a smile would come on their face. And then they would share about how great they are, how, how this God, my higher power, just lifts all of my problems away. And, and I'm following the program and working really hard. And it has given me so many benefits. And I just don't experience any, any problems. And I am positive, And I'm sharing as if I am a completely transformed human being so transformed that I'm actually wearing Jesus's sandals. I'm wonderful. And I'd be like sitting there going, you know, palm, palm slap. What? Nothing real. People would, after, you know, maybe knowing me for a couple of days, suddenly be saying, I love you. I love you. I hated it. Love is something so incredibly special. And all of the people, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I'd be like, don't, don't, please. You're, you're just using that word. You are, you just, love becomes nothing. Nothing. It's meaningless. Speak that word when you really mean it. But I was crazy. And I was dark. Oh, Carol has so many problems that she just can't ever accept that people love her. No. <laughs> I can, actually. But uh, you don't. So don't speak it. I had to let go of friends because of their lies. And I was in a store the other day and I heard this song and I remember this friend, Susan, and I, boy, God, I still miss her. Um, and we laughed. So we had such a good time together. And that song in particular, if we would hear it in a store, we would start dancing in the store. And I heard that song. And it didn't bring me happiness. It brought me sadness because I really miss her. But I couldn't tolerate the lies. I could not tolerate the lies that she told.
she was addicted to pharmaceuticals. Her motto was something about, I don't know, pharmaceutical living is better. I don't, I can't remember. But she was very addicted to painkillers and she would shop around. She would go to emergency rooms, to emer another emergency room. Oh, and the lies that she would tell, it just, it got to the point where I couldn't really trust much of what she was saying. And I, I told her, I can't do this anymore. I can't do the lying. And she was also, her boyfriend was drinking, claiming he was sober. I could smell it on him. She was in denial. These were people in AA. And this was not the kind of behavior that you allow people to engage in, in AA. But, but it became that. Hell, I had a sponsor in Great Barrington who I went to and I said, I am sponsoring, and I was sponsoring this guy. And I knew he was drinking. And I went to a meeting and he qualified, meaning that he was the speaker of this meeting and he said he had seven months of sobriety. And I'm sitting in this meeting and I'm looking at other people and I'm looking at the people who know that he is drinking and none of them have this expression of what the fuck is going on. And I did speak to my sponsor and she said, well, alcoholics lie. All right, this alcoholic doesn't. And this alcoholic really does believe that when you're actively alcoholic, you might be lying. But when you get back into the program, you are absolutely now a member of AA and, well, rigorous honesty. Hmm, what about that rigorous honesty? Did anybody confront anybody? No. Now, if that took place in the 80s in Manhattan, where I got sober, no one would have permitted him to speak at all. But if somebody was maintaining that they were sober and they were drinking, and people knew it at the meeting, they would have stood up and said, this guy is drinking. In the middle of the meeting, they would not have allowed that. And that kind of behavior, when you have other people calling one another out, it has a very good effect. And the effect is that, well, people begin to live honest lives. Today, it, it's like nothing matters to anybody. AA today? It's a joke. It's, it, it, the meetings that I've gone to, it's like sitting in a room filled with people who are dry drunks. You know, the years of sobriety, it, that's all that matters, is the number. The number. Not sober living. Yeah, I'm tired. I'm sick of it. You know, I could probably now 24 seven, just do live streaming of all of the lies I've heard, I've had to live the lies. I could tell story after story of my own pretense that I was living, but do we not grow? <laughs> Is it not our responsibility to grow beyond it? Yes. 
Yes, because if we don't, we remain children. And children, well, their brains operate in this kind of fantastical way. And I see a lot of adult children today doing whatever the hell they want. As if they themselves get to determine what's right, what's wrong, and that determination really is based on, well, their own self-centered desires. Everything's a lie. And it's, it has become, well, we're living it, right? You live principles and you get shot down. Because just doing whatever the hell you want to do, that's the cool thing. Living a principled life, oh, that's not cool. Speaking honestly... And living the principles, well, when you live the principles, those people in your life, you know, what is a true friend? What is a true friend? A real friend will call you out on whatever it is that you do, the, the crap that you do. And we're all engaged in it. And, you know, at any age, we can do things that are not right. And a true friend will say, hey, man, that's not right. And that's gone by the wayside. And a true friend will actually want for you your own self. Will want for you to grow into that authentic being that you could be if you did that work. And a true friend, certainly a true Christian friend, do they not try to keep one another on that narrow road? Because if you're not doing that with one another, you're not really friends. You've just decided that you enjoy one another and you're simply just doing things to kind of waste time until you die. Is there any meaning to anything anymore? Well, when you're, you're somebody who has been born into a country that has been founded on a lie and nobody resolves anything, then, yeah, you end up living an existence that Everything's just meaningless. You want meaning? You try to engage others in that kind of meaningful relationship and, well, if you can't find those like-minded, you'll end up getting attacked. This is not right. It's very wrong. But this right here, Listen to this. You are a well-spoken young man. Where were you yesterday when the shooting started? So yesterday I was in my AP environmental science class. We had just taken out all of our notes and we were about to pack up to leave for, uh, we were about to leave school and we hear a pop. And it, it happened to be a gunshot that echoed through the hallway. And because of that, my teacher actually went and closed the door. But as soon as she closed the door, the fire alarm was pulled. On the day of the shooting, I got my camera and got on my bike and rode as fast as I could three miles from my house to the school to get as much video and get him as many interviews as I could because I knew that it, this could not be another mass shooting. No, I don't know about you boys or girls out there, but that to me is outright lies. Now, that he actually had to say, I don't know about you boys and girls out there, but to me, that is an outright lie. It's unfortunate that anybody needed to qualify 
what they heard in any way, shape, or form. It is an outright lie. And if you didn't hear that outright lie, something is wrong with you. Outright lies on mainstream media and this narcissistic, what, some have said that he's 25 years old. I could care less about the details of this because it's all the same crap that it persists, these events that take place, that it persists means that we live in a very sick, damaged country. That it persists, these agendas, these shootings, and <laughs> the immediacy with which those gun control propagandists come out, that it persists only means that Americans are really screwed up because if Americans, if the majority of Americans did not accept lies, we would never have heard from this kid. Never. If we held people accountable and didn't get socially engineered to believe that well, what did our President Obama say? And what have presidents said when they campaign? Yes, Bush, Cheney, they need to be held accountable. Investigations need to be um, uh, conducted. Uh, how could we have gotten into this Iraq war based on a lie? Yes, we are going to hold those people accountable. They get into office and they say, well, we're not going to look back. We've got to move forward. We accept this over and over and over again. We accept lying all of the time. The acceptor of the lie is actually more damaging than the liar. Like the evil people that you can't change. Liars, compulsive liars, they could be gotten rid of if those around the compulsive liar didn't accept it and said, you're lying again. They'd be shamed. And shame is actually, there is a reason for it. When we behave badly and somebody calls us out on it, and we do have that, ooh, oh God, exposed, one would hope that that person wouldn't engage again in that behavior that brought them shame. But when you don't ever call anybody out and you just permit everything and you just go along to get along and you never confront anybody because, oh, confrontation, that's bad. And, oh, my God, you're blaming somebody? You're blaming? Oh, we can't play the blame game, right? But the same people who say we can't play the blame game are continually blaming everybody else for their own failings. Great. What a fabulous country we have. An abject lie. This, this, look, this guy disgusts me. Liars repulse me. All right, so, mainstream media, he tells two completely different stories. Completely different. I was at home, I heard about it, got on my bike, and grabbed my camera. Boom. Oh, I was in school, I heard the pop. Yeah, really? How? How is it that this, this despicable human being is still on the national stage, mainstream media, depicted as a good human being? How could he still be on the national stage, on mainstream media, talking as if he's credible. Lies mean something. And I don't care if I'm the last person to really take very seriously truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. I don't care. 
it does not matter that 99% of your community, your family, your friends, those within your country have fallen prey to, ah, who gives a shit, people lying. I'm still going to sit and stare at my TV, listening to this kid as if he's credible and he's a voice. Yeah, okay. Liars have agendas. Those who promote liars have agendas. Those who accept the lies have agendas. And all of those agendas relate to that one individual who is so grossly self-centered they only care about their own life and achieving the ends. Achieving their objective. Not caring about anybody else. If you cannot speak the truth, something is wrong with you. But my entire life, I have lived saturated in lies. And it's only gotten worse. And if anybody thinks that we're going to get anywhere, now, I'm not talking about David Hogg in particular, but, but, well, I am in particular, but just he is an example. Yeah, he doesn't get removed from mainstream media. He doesn't get called out for the lies. In fact, channels have been taken off or videos taken off of YouTube of those who have exposed David Hogg for what he is. Yeah, those who expose liars, get destroyed. How is this possible? It can only be possible if you have the majority within that country allowing that to happen. Doing nothing. Holding no one accountable and just allowing the lies and the liars to just go on lying. As if, as if, that's a fine thing, and it's not. It's despicable. And yeah, there is a very destructive war that is heating up. Many have suffered the consequences of it. Many have been the casualties of it. Many who are awake and know it, who have not experienced the consequences of it, I would imagine that a lot of them still feel this invincibility that it's not going to come to them and it will come to them. And because they're still operating with the, this normalcy bias, they're not changing themselves. They're doing just the same old, same old. Everything gets worse. Everything gets worse. I am tired of it. And I've got to shift gears. And fortunately, I finally got to, you know what? I really don't care. You can unsub me. You can, you know, leave your nasty comments. You can do whatever it is that you want to do at this point. Those of you who are still absolutely still living your lies. Work needs to be done. People leave, well, you're still railing about all the problems and you never talk about solutions. Yes, I do. Yeah, I do. You just don't want to hear the solutions. The solution is you. You. Facing the whole truth, not just that truth that you have sliced and diced and that truth relating to what's happening to us collectively. If you really are about the truth and living that principle, then you will be 
taking in the whole truth. And the most important truth is the personal truth. The most important truth to get to is the truth within inside you. And if you have not begun to do that work, then you are absolutely part of the problem. You will never be part of the solution. And I will tell you what needs to be engaged. That work that needs to be engaged. You stop lying and you really do that work necessary to live honestly. Live honestly. And that requires a constant check, actually. It requires you asking yourself, am I living honestly? Am I living the principles that I speak? Or am I just speaking them? Am I walking the talk? Or am I just talking and talking and talking? Am I working on myself? So that I can grow. So that I can stop being an adult child. So that I can get to that place of no longer needing somebody else to tell me the solution. That I'm actually an individual who thinks, all right, I got to come up with solutions. Instead of asking someone else for it. When you get to the place where you no longer need a leader, where you can speak honestly, And it becomes so a principle that you live that you can't not. That it is no longer an option. And yes, you have to live the consequences. And those consequences could very well be leaving you alone. And it's hard, but that's the narrow road. If you can't get there, then you, will, you, you just won't be a force in this fight. You can't engage. You'll continue living your life. I have to shift to now what I really feel is required in this fight. And that is the personal. And I remember six years ago when I started posting videos on the personal, whoa, I got people private messaging me saying, don't do that. You can't be talking about the personal. Because I wouldn't get very many subscribers. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now that's very telling, isn't it? Look, you know, guys, there are very obvious things, very immediate things that people could do. And if they did them, if we had not a lot of people doing them, the ripple effect of it could really kind of take off. But I think Americans now are so disturbed that they're really gone. They're so lost. They're, uh, and what they live, you know, as long as they can tell themselves, I'm good. I'm spiritual. Oh, I believe in God. I'm a Christian. I'm this, I'm that. As long as they can maintain that delusion, then, <laughs> well, I, I just, I don't know what to say about that, but uh, they maintain that delusion as they live a life that is so contrary to their delusion. It's, well, you know, we have a whole lot of well-adjusted to a deeply disturbed society who really don't give a shit about anything but their own life. Oh, they maintain the care. Oh, and I'm so compassionate. And, and everything is about them. When you get to a point where suddenly 
your life is no longer about you, but it is about something bigger than you, you know you're on the right road. And the first step, and if you miss this step, you ain't going to get there. The first step is honesty, rigorous honesty, living an honest life and speaking honestly. You give up the lie. And yes, we have had a majority of Christians. And you know what? If they had given up that lie, if they took seriously what it says in the Bible, lying is an abomination, we would not be living this nightmare. So something went wrong with Christians. Yes, 90% of the population was Christian in the 90s. Now, I think it's somewhere 74%. You're still a huge majority. Something has grossly gone wrong with an awful lot of Christian people who believe that they are saved and going to heaven and they don't have to do anything. God is going to be coming down and he's going to fix everything and make everything right. And Jesus is coming back so I can just sit back and do friggin' nothing. And I don't even have to really feel the suffering of so many people around me. No, it's all good. It's all good. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to clean up my sins, even though Jesus says that very clearly in the Bible. And I can just keep lying, well, because I'm a sinner. And, well, but Jesus said, clean it up. No, okay, I don't have to do anything. I don't, I can just keep hurting people, betraying people, not care about any principles in my life. I can just keep living comfortably because, oh, Jesus died on the cross. Oh, just, I uh, think yesterday, did he? Yeah, and he's going to be resurrected with chocolate bunnies tomorrow. Yeah. I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is ask, Jesus, come into my heart, save me. I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. I don't have to really do anything. Because, hey... Christ, he was brought to us by God so that we could live a really comfortable life and just wait it out until we go to heaven. How fabulous. You are absolutely 100% part of the nightmare. Yeah. Sorry if that offends, but it's the truth. If you are not, if you are not living honestly, if you are speaking lies, ooh, I'll speak your language. You've got Satan in you, and you've got to do some work. Two, get out of your delusion that you're all about Jesus and begin to attend to that devil inside. You've got to face your own deception. And that's not just for Christians, everybody. Everybody, we've got to face our own deception. Because without that, you'll never change. And therefore, nothing will change.